Holly, and with my sister Heather, you're listening to Haunted Family Podcast, a weekly podcast about the paranormal, unsolved mysteries, and even some true crime. And Heather is recovering from the flu. I am, so I apologize because I still sound really bad, but I have had to put off recording every day this week because I was too sick to even raise my head, let alone put headphones on and record. Um, okay, so before we jump into the topic, for once, I do not have a random story, but you do. Well, this isn't really random. Our topic today takes place in the very interesting state of Ohio. Which is our neighbor. It is. Ohio also is often jokingly referred to as the serial killer capital of the country. Yeah, I, I was it at, I think it was at Thanksgiving when we were talking, we were all sitting around and we were talking about this podcast and our possible topics coming up. We mentioned Ohio and Ernie said, yeah, girls in Ohio like to go missing. And we laughed, but that's, it was so awful of us to all laugh about that because it's true Ohio has one of the highest missing person list for women, like, of anybody. Not just missing, but, like, bodies will turn up. Well, I mean, pretty much of everybody, but it's just, it's terrible. And I always think to the movie Lost Boys, like, I think, man, it must be Ohio. Because, you know, when they were going through that tunnel and it said murder capital of the world? Yeah. I really think that that's Ohio per capita. Yeah. So, um, there's a man incarcerated in Ohio and he's sitting on death row by the name of Alva Campbell Jr. You all may have um, heard of him. Last year, Alva was set to be executed for killing, oh, let's see, he killed an 18 year old. During a carjacking in 1997. And last year when he was up for execution, they ended up having to cancel his execution because he was deemed not medically fit to be executed. They couldn't find a vein to administer the lethal injection drugs. Well, his attorney is now arguing that if the state wishes to proceed with his execution, that firing squad should be considered. That's so crazy to me. I would, I don't know. I think I would rather I don't know. I think I'd rather anything than firing squad. That's just so scary. Well, his attorney is arguing that the firing squad will not cause severe suffering because it doesn't require drugs that Mr. Campbell may have an allergic reaction to. It doesn't involve the involvement of a doctor. And virtually, this is his attorney's words, virtually eliminates the unconstitutional lingering death and other severe physical and mental pain and suffering that lethal injection may cause. Uh, Okay, I would have more mental anguish at the thought of people shooting me and maybe missing or... I think it's set up now where um, where actual people aren't involved in firing squads. So even more likely that they're going to miss. But the only other way that the execution could proceed is if the state adopts a... And this is um, directly from Cleveland.com's website. A closely regulated lethal injection process that includes a headpiece to monitor the brain activity... Of the inmate and medicine on hand to revive him should lethal injection drugs fail to work. But have we ever had lethal injection drugs not work? Actually, I think so. Oh, well, I didn't know. And you know what? You asked a good question, so I'm going to search for that real quick. Okay, I've also got a cough drop in my mouth, and Holly will probably at some point during this episode yell at me for using it too loud. Probably. She's weird about that. Okay, I'm on deathpenaltyinfo.org, and under the botched executions list, it says that 
an estimated 3% of U.S. executions from 1890 to 2010 were botched. Oh. Out of 1,054 lethal injections administered, 75 failed. That's a failure rate of 7.12%. That's higher than I That is higher than any other method of execution on this list. Out of 34 firing squads administered, zero failed. Out of 593 executions via gas chamber, 32 were botched, a failure rate of 5.4%. Out of 4,374 electrocutions, 84 were botched, a failure rate of 1.92%. Out of 2,721 hangings, 85 were botched, a failure rate of 3.12%. See, that's the one that I thought would be the most likely to be botched. When it turns out that it's lethal injection. That's weird. Yeah. Yet that is the preferred manner of execution in the United States now. I would personally prefer something with a higher, um, well, with a lower fail rate. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um. We'll keep. Um. We'll keep you all updated on. On this case, whether or not he gets his execution via firing squad or not. Yeah. I don't think. I don't think Ohio allows the firing squad anymore. I don't. I don't know if any state does. Let's see. Capital punishment in the United States. All 31 states with the death penalty provide for lethal injection. There are some states that have no death penalty. What states are those? It looks like we're getting into um, stuff that I did not research. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, me either. Okay, this is as of November 9th, 2016. And it says that Alaska, Connecticut, Delaware, Hawaii, Illinois, Iowa, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, North Dakota, Rhode Island, Vermont, West Virginia, and Wisconsin, and the District of Columbia um, do not have a death penalty. So pretty much all of our New England states. Yeah, and... And Colorado, Oregon, Pennsylvania, and Washington have a gubernatorial moratorium, meaning the governor has froze all and temporarily suspended all executions. See, I was just having this conversation with Hannah. Uh, The other day, she was talking about her mom used to work as a prison guard at the federal... That's not federal... Where was she a guard at? West Liberty. It's a state state facility. Okay. So she was a a guard at the state prison. And she was saying that, like, one of her people, one of her inmates, was executed. And I was like, what? We don't really execute anybody. Like, that's not... It's not common. It's, It's very, very, very uncommon. So I looked it up. And then, of course, I forgot what it was because, you know, I didn't know that we were going to talk about that tonight. Hold on, I'll look that up. It looks like the last person Kentucky executed was Marco Allen Chapman in 2008. Yeah, that's what I'm saying is that it doesn't happen often here. Okay, well, tonight's topic actually has absolutely nothing to do with... uh, execution at all because this person has never been found (laughs) right yeah this is actually an unsolved crime from the 30s 1930s 
Oh, wait, hold on. I was looking up states that allowed for alternative death penalties. Electro electrocution, I almost said electrocution, is still allowed in Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Kentucky, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia. That's funny. So you're a southern state. I don't think that Kentucky has executed anybody by lethal by electrocution since the nineties. I want to say it was like ninety seven. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, when we talked about Ted Bundy, he was actually electric chair. Yeah. Um, gas chamber is still allowed in Arizona and California. Firing squad is still on the books in Utah. For some reason, that doesn't surprise me. Um, no. And hanging is still allowed in Washington. But I believe that the de default manner of electric of um, execution is always lethal injection in every state. Yeah. And that's crazy that it's the one with the most errors. Yeah. The last person to be killed by electrocution was in um, 2013. The last person by firing squad was 2010. Last person, oh, that soon. Last person for lethal and for um, gas chamber was 1999. And the last person to be hanged was 1996. Really? Yeah. Okay, so let's get to the topic at hand. <laughs> Yeah, that was a very, very wild detour that we just took. But I hope it was entertaining. I hope, I hope it was interesting to our listeners. Yeah. So our topic for tonight is an unsolved murder. Well, unsolved serial murder. The Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. Uh huh. Also known as the Cleveland Torso Murder. I like the other name a lot better. Yeah, it, it sounds very. It's got some finesse. Like yeah. Which is kind of interesting because these murders were very similar in in um, style to Jack the Ripper. Not necessarily how the bodies were mutilated, but in the sense that they began and ended abruptly. And that all of the victims were drifters and lower class. Pretty much all of the victims came from the southeast Kingsbury Run area of Cleveland, which was a shanty town, basically. Yeah, it was like, um, pretty much like, imagine, like, just an area where there's, like, makeshift housing, um, trash cans that are on fire for warmth, you know, I mean, any kind of, like, homeless scenario that you can create in your head. That's kind of the area that we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Elliot Ness, who is more famous for Al Capone and, you know, the Untouchables, was um, public safety director for Cleveland at the time. And he was instrumental in getting the Kingsbury Run area burnt to the ground, demolished. But he had... Virtually nothing to do with the Cleveland Torso murder investigation. Right. So I think one of the saddest parts of this is the fact that they only have an absolute, positive, solid ID of two victims. Well, I've got that they've got an ID of three. The third is they possibly believe it was her. They have, you know, strong evidence, but it wasn't a 100% slam dunk this is her uh -uh. so they started in 1935 with um what is referred to as the lady of the lake and she wasn't well i mean like with most serial murders you don't actually know that the first victim is the first victim uh it takes a few victims before you realize hey we got a serial thing going on here so a headless lady was pulled out of Lake Erie and she, her head was cut off, her arms were cut off, and her legs were cut off right about the knee. 
So she literally was just a torso. Uh, and she was never identified. And this was in September, September of 1934. Yeah. I mean, and some do not place the Lady of the Lake as one of the Mad Butcher's victims. But if you look at how the body was mutilated, she was one of his victims. Yeah. I don't know how anybody could argue that she wasn't. Okay, and then we've got Edward. And Drossy. And Dr- Rock. Of course, it would not be Haunted Family Podcast if we got all of the names Right, yeah. so I'm thinking it's Androssi. Yeah, um, Edward Androssi, September 23rd, 1935, and he was found in the Jackass Hill area of Kingsbury Run, and I, I love that. Name I that cracked name. up laughing when I read that. I probably should not be laughing, you know, while researching a crime podcast, but I, I did. Yeah, and we've got we've got some odd named places here in Kentucky too. But yeah, um, yeah, he was his wow. body was actually found very close to where uh, where one of the Jane, one of the John Does was, which found. they believe most have this part. The next one listed as the serial killer's first victim, but he wasn't. Um, yeah. What freaks me out the most about the Edward and Drassy murder was that his head and his genitals were all removed while he was still alive. Yeah. So, I mean, he was clearly tortured. And it was probably genitals first. Oh, well, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and he was found completely naked except for a pair of socks. Yeah, and that's what makes me wonder. I mean, why leave his socks on? Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe our killer has, like, like weird feet, feet issues. That's entirely possible. Yeah. Um. Now, the other victim who was found at this same site, like, 30 feet apart, was also emasculated and decapitated. But his skin had been treated with some chemical that turned it leathery. Like yeah, they like was... they had tanned his skin while it was still on him. This man was sick, who whoever this man yeah. or woman is. This body had been there well, this body had been dead for probably a month, as opposed to Edward Androssi, who had only been dead maybe three days. Right. But both of them were found on the same day, September 23rd, 1935, and in the same location. Then you have victim number three, Florence Geneva Polito. Polio, I think. Polio. Polio. Okay. And she was found January 26th, February 7th-ish, 1936. And she was kind of downtown Cleveland. Um, Between 2325 East 20th Street and 1419 Orange Avenue. I've only ever been to Cleveland once, and that was to the Cleveland Clinic. I have no idea where these are in relation to Cleveland Clinic. Yeah, I, I don't either. I mean, remember, we were very close to Cleveland when we took Abby's ex-boyfriend to audition for Blue Coats. Yeah. A couple years ago, I almost went to Cleveland to buy a parrot, but it went from he was going to meet me halfway to I needed to go to his house. It just seemed very, very, I couldn't find anybody to go with me. All of my big, scary, mean male friends were busy that day. I was probably going to get abducted, so. Well, I mean, it's Ohio. They do have the highest rate of missing women so I mean I wouldn't have gone which I believe I told you don't go by yourself Florence was also dismembered her head was never found they were able to identify her um, from fingerprints and she had been in her location probably two to four days yeah um did you say did you mention that her head was never recovered 
I did. Okay, sorry. My ears are cloggy, too. Um, her body was wrapped up in newspaper. I found that to be a very odd thing. Right. Well, see, okay, she... She was fa- like parts of her body were found near Central Avenue and East Twentieth, and then the majority of her body was wrapped up in the newspapers and stuffed in a basket. So she was kind of scattered. Yeah, and then your next victim is John Doe number two. Who has been nicknamed the Tattooed Man. Yeah. This is another one that really disturbs me. Because nobody... Like, they were able to do a plaster cast of his head. So that people could see what he would look like. He was actually a very and, attractive man. Yeah, he was. And he had distinctive tattoos on his body. And they still were not able to identify him. Based on, you know, his face and his tattoos and he was found june 5th 1936 yeah he had only been there for about about two days yeah but i mean this was an area so much this was an area that a lot of drifters and maybe if it hadn't been the depression and communication had been a little easier then they could have got his picture out you know to a wider area and may have found him well found, found ken but I mean, we still have those today. Why can't we get people, it out now? People don't seem to want to. People don't seem to think about searching through their ancestors and finding interesting mysteries. Like, hey, no. our uncle who had the really awesome tattoos just sort of disappeared in 1936, and this body was found in 1936 and had interesting tattoos. I wonder if they could be related. Well, I would hope that if I ever go missing, that somebody could ID me based on my tattoos. Well, because I don't know of many people that have a cow. Particularly that cow. Right. Because your tattoo is very distinctive. Yeah, it is a exact replica of a stuffed cow that I used to sleep with. Actually, I still have this stuffed cow. But I don't, I don't sleep with the name one because he's old. Yeah, his name is Calvin. He is my niece's oldest brother. John Doe number three was found on July twenty second, nineteen thirty six, in the Big Creek area of Brooklyn, not New York, but West Cleveland. Uh, and just like the others, his head was cut off while he was alive, and. But like the tattooed man, his head was also recovered. But they were never able to determine who he was. That's, I don't know, that's just weird to me that... Yeah, um, Cleveland actually has a crime museum, which is pretty fitting since, you know, so many crimes have happened in Cleveland. Yeah. Um, and you can actually see the plaster masks of several of the victims in the crime museum. I might actually go to Cleveland for that and pray I don't get abducted and end up in someone's basement. Yeah. Or locked up in their house because that happens too. How long were those girls that were in Cleveland, how long were they locked up? Uh, Ariel Castell's Castro's victims. Yeah. Like 18 years maybe? Uh, let me look this up. First one was kidnapped in 2002, and on, as we all know, on May 6, 2013, Amanda Berry was able to escape with her daughter, and within hours, Castro was arrested, and the other girls were free, and we might do a whole episode on them. Yeah, I think we should. Those, those women are amazing survivors. Okay, so then we've got... Which John Doe was that? Three? Yeah. Now, John Doe number four, they actually had his body out on display for a while. 
Did you know that? Yeah, he had, I didn't know that, but his body was never found. I mean, his head was never found. His body was found. But he was actually, there was nothing remaining of him below his waist. And this was September 10th of 1936. John Doe. 1936, he was just burning it up on killing he people. He killed, estimated he killed 10 people in 1936. So most of his killings happened in 36. No, but this is the thing. Most of his killings in Cleveland we don't right. We, they also we don't know that, that he, he didn't move on to another city after this, right? Because he it just abruptly ended. Who knows where he's at? Serial killers rarely just stop. Something has made them stop, or they've moved to a new territory. Right, but I mean, I'm sure that he knows that Cleveland rocks. I've heard that. Yeah, there's like a song about it or something. Yeah, I, I think I remember something about that. Cleveland rocking. <laughs> you can go online and actually see all of the pictures from, well, not all of the victims' pictures, but many of the victims' pictures. Um, some of them is actually where they were found, if you're into that sort of creepy thing. It's my least favorite thing about. But I still look every time. I know. Okay, so then we've got Jane Doe. Number one, and she was found February 23rd, 1937, on Euclid Beach, which was like a beach off of Lake Erie. She was actually found at the same spot that the Lady of the Lake was found. And if you've learned anything from us, serial killers tend to use the same, they tend to use Dumping places area. that they're comfortable with. So you'll see the same dump areas with the same. Um, locations for where they picked up their victims over and over and over again. Because they're, they're comfortable with that location. Jane Doe number two is his only black victim. He did not seem to discriminate male, female, age. But for whatever reason, this was his only black victim. He was on June 6, 1937. And she had been she'd been dead for about a year when she was discovered. Yeah, and her her head was discovered. Her head was recovered, but she was. She, I mean, she was also decapitated. And missing they just a, happened to find her head and missing a rib. Missing a rib. Yeah, and I don't know if that's because she had been laying out for a year. Did an animal come and take the rib, or did he cut out the rib? I don't know. She was found beneath the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge. That, and I also have a question, which we don't know the answer to, but did she lay under that bridge for a year? Or did he keep her somewhere and then dump her closer to the one-year mark? That's an interesting question. I would think that if she laid under a bridge for a year, that someone would have found her a lot sooner. Right, and that she would be mostly decomposed. Yes. Um, exactly a month later, in July, July 6, 1937, John Doe 5 was pulled out of the Cuyahoga River um, in the Cleveland Flats area. He was decapitated, but his head was never recovered. Hmm. I just found something interesting. Okay. So, I was... I was... Looking at pictures of the murders, of actually the dump sites, um, trying to get an idea of, about whether or not she was left there for a year, and I don't, I still don't know that answer. But they believe that the Black Dahlia murder was actually done by the Cleveland Torso murderer. I could see that. Yeah, but I mean that's also another unsolved murder so someday when I have time I might try to piece together similar unsolved murders from across the country that'd be an interesting project finding the time would be hard but okay so then we've got John Doe 5 who was okay hold on 
found on July 6th. What? So, I just did a search, and I don't know if this is how accurate this is, but Euclid Beach Park is yes. only about 11 miles from the bridge that he jumped from. Really? Yeah. But, I mean, in 1930, that might have been a major feat. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. That's off topic. Let's get back to topic. We've been very wandery tonight. We have been. I'm blaming cold medicine. This one was pulled out of the river at Cleveland Flats. He was also a male. Um, head was never found. Really, there's nothing... In, I mean, not interesting, but there's nothing unusual about this one other than he was beheaded and the head was never found but so he wasn't but he was nothing, he was thrown in the river so so yeah so we don't know what may have washed off um jane doe number three was also pulled from the Cuyahoga river in the cleveland flats area on april 8th 1938 yeah well she was kind of found in pieces. On April 8th, um, one of her lower legs washed up. On May 2nd, one of her thighs was found floating in the river. Between, um... West and 3rd Street Bridge. Yeah. Um, and then police decided they were going to search under that bridge, and they found a burlap sack containing... A headless female torso cut into half, another thigh, and a left foot. The head and the rest of her body has never been um, found. This was also the only victim to have been found with drugs in her system. Really? Yes. Okay, then we've got Jane Doe, number four, August 16th, 1938. And she was found at the East Ninth Street Lakeshore dump, decapitated, and her head was covered, was covered, was recovered. Um, she'd been out there for about four to six months, or she'd been dead for four to six months. We don't know how long she'd actually been there. Yeah, and then that same day they found... John Doe, number six, also at the dump. Um, he was decapitated. His found was his head was found in a can. Yeah, they, neither one of them. Yeah, were they estimated that he had been dead for about nine months. So those are the abs. Those are the victims that are absolutely linked to the mad butcher of Kingsbury Run, and that's. That's exclusively right. what I'm going to call him because I think that's a much cooler name than Cleveland Tur Torso Murder. Okay, you can call him that then. Good, because I'm going to. <laughs> um, okay, so then we've also got a, something that may be attached to him, and it was a headless body of a guy that was found in a boxcar in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. This was on July 1st, 1936. Uh, and then three more headless victims were found in other boxcars near McKee's Rocks in Pennsylvania. Uh, and this was on May 3rd, 1940. Yeah. Um, dismembered bodies were also found in the swamp around Newcastle, Pennsylvania. Um, they were found stretching from 1921 to 1934. And between 1939 and 1942. So, bracketing... After our Cleveland. Yeah, bracketing yeah. Cleveland. That's an interesting turn of events. In my way of thinking. Yeah. So, we've got some suspects. But, nobody was ever tried and convicted. So, hold on. I was getting ready to pull up when um, Black Dahlia Murder happened. And I really hate the fact that every time you type in Black Dahlia Murder, you get the stupid band. 
Oh, I didn't know that there was a band. Yes. I'm sorry if any of our listeners like that band. I'm sorry if you are a member of that band and you are listening to us. But when I type in Black Dahlia murder, I want to find out about the girl who was murdered. I don't want to find out about your band. Actually, Anthony made me watch a documentary about the band. And the guys in the band seem really painfully nerdy. But like, oh, they, well. they, they seem like people that I would actually hang out with. So I kind of feel bad for, you know, ragging on them so hard. <laughs> but most, most band people are nerdy. Yeah. Um, her murder happened in January of 47. So it's possible. It, it's possible. Um, forty seven would be well after our Pennsylvania murders and our Cleveland murders, and it would be before our next murder in Cleveland, which happened in nineteen fifty on july twenty second nineteen fifty forty one year old Robert Robertson. I really hate when parents name their children and things like that. I do too. It was found at a business in, on Davenport Avenue in Cleveland. Um, they estimate he had been dead for eight weeks. So I'm guessing it was a closed business. I guess. I couldn't imagine going to my work and like not noticing that there's a dead body. And um, he had been decapitated. He fit the overall um, M.O. of our Mad Butcher. The victim was estranged from all his family. He had a arrest record, um, a drinking problem, sort of existed on the fringes of society. Somebody that wouldn't be missed or wouldn't be looked for right away. Detectives in the case refused to link it to the 36 murders. But it looks like it probably was. I think so. It fits the overall um, case well, structure. Yeah. Okay, so are we ready to talk about our suspects? We, we do have a few suspects. Yeah, we have a, um, a man by the name of Frank Dolzal. Delizo. This guy was 52. He was arrested initially just as a suspect in the Florence Polio's murder. Uh, And he said that he did it, and then he said he didn't do it. Um. Anyway, then he said that he only said he did it because he was beaten until he confessed. But we know that he couldn't have been the killer because he died um, under very suspicious circumstances in the Cuyahoga County Jail. And we know that murders took place after Miss Polio's death. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, he supposedly hung himself. However, um, he also had six broken ribs that all of his friends say he did not have when he was arrested by um, Sheriff Martin O'Donnell six weeks before. Yeah, and uh, he hung himself, but he, he was too tall to actually hang himself where he was supposed to have hung himself, so... Um, probably didn't kill himself. So then we've got Dr. Francis E. Sweeney. And uh, this is a medical doctor, not just somebody with a PhD. He was a veteran of World War I and was part of a medical unit that had done amputations. So... He was very familiar with, for lack of a better phrase, of cutting bodies up. He was interviewed by Elliot Ness, 
and he had two false positive, not false positive, but two false um, pass when he took a polygraph test. Ness thought, okay, then this has got to be the person. And Sweeney would send him, like, harassing messages, and I don't know, he was just kind of a a douchebag and was kind of mocking and harassing uh, Ness and his family. I don't know, but he died in 1964 uh, at the VA hospital in Dayton. And that's it for our suspects, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. So we've got a bunch of dead bodies and two suspects that they were never able to actually pin it on. And we've got a bunch of people that probably were his victims, but they're not actually tying them together. So who knows? You know, I would say that being a doctor, Dr. Sweeney would have the means to move around to the various places that our Mad Butcher most likely killed. Yeah. I think that Dr. Sweeney is probably the prime suspect. He's the most slash... logical suspect. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, we do have a stupid criminal. And our stupid criminal this week comes to you from um, our neighbors in Boyd County, Kentucky. Okay. Let me pull up the actual news article. I am actually going to this place later this week. The jail? Why are you going to the jail? I'm not going to the jail. I'm just going to the county. Oh. The jail is wanting to open a child care center. Well, you know, honestly, that, that, <laughs> actually, it's not a bad idea. That, it's not a bad idea. I mean, guards have children, too. Okay. So, earlier this week, a friend sent me a um, news article from WYMT, which is one of our local news outlets. And the title said... Photo shows Boyd County inmate in guard uniform. And it's kind of a comical picture. He's got, you know, his hands sort of like, ha ha ha, you know, in front of him. You caught me. Big smirky grin on his face. And the article goes on to describe that inmate Brandon Sots was standing in a jail cell with clothing worn by guards. Um, the guard uniform is a black polo shirt with a um, Boyd County Detention Center badge embroidered on it, khaki pants with a belt. So, I mean, pretty plain, pretty basic. Um, goes on to describe that a female guard who wished to remain anonymous says that she took the photo originally as evidence to show her supervisor when she reported the incident. She said um, to the um, newspaper, apparently he had had it for two days. And no one else had noticed these? No. She said that he was kind of making a joke about it when he was found with it in his cell. Now, this is what gets me, though. She waited two days to show the picture to and inform her supervisor of this. Right, but she was concerned... That he could just waltz right out of the jail with any new employee. And she's right. He could. But why didn't you immediately report it? Boyd County has had recent escape. Actually, I think they just now captured the last person who escaped when four inmates escaped on December 28th by getting through an unlocked door, getting access to the roof via a air conditioning duct that they broke off. And they just now arrested the last one of those escapees. So, Boyd County has a history of escapes. Yeah. Two days after she met with her supervisor, she was fired, along with another female guard, for having their cell phones out while at work, taking this picture of the inmate, and for not immediately getting the uniform back from Sots. Okay, I can see being fired for not reporting it immediately. It wasn't her responsibility to get the uniform back because female guards cannot touch male inmates. But why didn't she immediately grab a male guard and make him take that uniform off the inmate by force if necessary? Right. 
and immediately go to your supervisor. Yes, and immediately charge the inmate with, you know, everything you can charge him with. Contraband, attempted escape, because having a guard's uniform, you're thinking about escaping, even if, you know, you're not. You know, just hit him with everything you possibly can. But she didn't. She waited two days to take it to her supervisor. So I personally have nothing, I have find nothing wrong with them firing her for this. I think it absolutely was a firing offense. Right. Not so much for having her cell phone out at work, but for failing to immediately correct the situation. Telling her supervisor right then. Um, finding male guards that can address the situation with force if necessary. So I have no problem with her getting fired. I have a lot of problems with the actions that she took or failed to take in addressing this situation. Let's address the situation of how the hell did he get a guard uniform? You know, it's been rumored it's been rumored a lot. And I think one of the inmates that escaped back in December even said that they're having help from the inside. They're having help from guards. So either a guard gave him the uniform or a guard gave him access to an area of the jail that he shouldn't have and he got access to the uniform. I, but either I don't believe that he just happened to accidentally get this uniform in his possession. Um, right. I have been told that every night before bed the inmates at the Boyd County Detention Center get a candy bar and a pop. What? Yeah. I mean, and listen, I am not one that promotes the rough treatment of our inmates. I'm not. I believe that everybody, even if you are incarcerated, needs to be treated with basic human dignity. But, I mean, there's basic human dignity and then there's coddling you. Um, right. I Did think... I think too? Maybe. I think that... Boyd County Detention Center is in desperate need of regime change. Right, it sounds like it. Because they are creating a system where it is not safe. I kind of feel I feel sorry for the guards who work there because with that many escapes and an inmate getting a uniform, it can't be a very healthy work environment for the guards. Uh, yeah, but and, it's, not. and it cannot be a very healthy environment for the majority of the inmates. Brandon Seitz was in carcerated for rape, sodomy, and unlawful transaction with a minor. He actually led the U.S. Marshals on a manhunt in 2016. And you're allowing him to have a guard uniform for days. Yes. I mean, two days with before this f- female um, guard noticed it, and then two days before she told her supervisor, he had his uniform for four days, probably, you know, longer than that. Right. So who knows when he was going to make the escape or whatever action he was going to do with said uniform. Yes. With a guard uniform, he could have just walked right out the front door. Yeah. He could have gotten to a position where he could have got a hold of, you know, a guard's pepper spray or a guard's handcuffs and created a very dangerous environment for the other inmates and the jail staff. Yeah. So, very, very serious situation in Boyd County. And I personally do not feel like the officials in Boyd County are taking this matter seriously. Well, maybe somebody who can do something is listening to us and can look into that matter. Maybe. I know we have very few listeners in the state of Kentucky, but... um, Yeah, that's true. I can tell you that I am incredibly disappointed in how Boyd County has handled this. I've actually been disappointed in how Wood County has handled their last several escapes, also. Usually, our stupid criminals are kind of funny. Let's see. Let's go back to August 20th, 2017. Do you know where you were August 20th, 2017? 
August 20th? I don't know. I'm sorry. I was watching the news because there was some live coverage of a riot at the Boyd County Jail. Oh. No, I missed that completely. Yes. Ten maximum security inmates seized cell block one um, got into a fight with two deputies forcing them to retreat and set fire to their bedding, blankets, toilet paper, anything they could get their hands on. It shut the jail, it shut the prison down for several days and maybe, maybe a month. 70 inmates had to be transferred to the Little Sandy Correctional Center in Carter County and um, a bunch had to be taken to the Pike County Detention Center. Pike County is not close to Boyd County. No, um, no, not at all. It's several hours yeah, away. Lawrence County and Johnson County and Floyd County are all between between there, but the regional jail that covers my county, Johnson County, was it's actually over capacity. They have inmates sleeping on mats on the floor with like maybe a half a foot between them. Um, and Floyd County is like over capacity also. I'm not for sure about our jail here. I, there are talks that we're getting a new one built, but that's all I know is that there's just talk. Oh, well, Rowan County also ha- houses Morgan County's inmates, don't they? They still I do think that? So, yeah. Yeah, because Morgan, Morgan County has a prison, but they don't have yeah, a jail. When I volunteered with Morgan County Sheriff's Office, I know that um, all of our inmates were housed in, John, in Rowan County. So, yeah, um, there's been a lot of, a lot of stuff going on in the Boyd County Detention Center. And the officials in Boyd County haven't really addressed these issues. Well, and now it's time that they need to. Yes. Yeah. Um, actually, in 2017, Boyd County also settled a $75,000 sexual harassment lawsuit that a former Boyd County Detention Center employee a female, brought against the jailer. Really? Yes. What did he do? Um, unwanted sexual advances and statements against her. So, um, sadly, the you... Yeah, well, n- not the, um, not the jailer. The, uh, um, her direct supervisor, Jeffrey Scott Salyer, which that name sounds familiar. And the jailer refused to address the situation. So, I mean, pretty much standard um, policy. Woman's being sexually harassed at work and the good old boys club inside the facility isn't going to do anything about it. I, I, I read a quote somewhere this um, earlier this morning that I think kind of sums up that. Actually kind of sums up this whole, whole um, episode. The world must be so beautiful for those who don't know how cruel it really is. I know I've said it once. I'll say it again. Ghosts don't scare me. The paranormal doesn't scare me. Demons don't scare me. What human beings do to each other terrifies me. Yeah, you should have stupid criminals is a lot more lighthearted than this. I mean, and I guess you can say, hey, 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 it's fun. And it may stole a guard uniform, but it's actually kind of scary. And it can lead to bad yeah. things. Yeah, very, very bad things. Okay, well, we're at the part of the episode that is the saddest when we say goodbye. So if you've got a stupid criminal that you want us to cover and it's something funny because we need something funny after this episode, um, send it to us at hauntedfamilypodcast at Um, gmail.com. You can also send us any... Uh, episode topics that you would like to hear um you can find us on facebook at haunted family podcast and you can find us on instagram at haunted family podcast so pretty much haunted family podcast everywhere because we're lame and we like to you know keep the same name yeah um you may have noticed we have a different look this week (laughs) i should have mentioned that at the beginning of the episode but i totally forgot um, yeah, we got a facelift. 
Got some new designs. Got some Botox. Yeah, we did. We lifted and tucked. Uh, new year, new me. Um... So let us know what you think of them because, you know, we want to know if we did a good job or if they are completely lame and they suck. Yeah. Um, also, if you would like to start a podcast because that is your New Year's resolution, you can sign up for one on Podbean and use our affiliate code, Haunted Family PB. Um, it doesn't cost you anything extra, but we get just a little bit back. And we really and love po- We would not be... Um, we would be talking about Podbean so much if we didn't truly love it. Yeah, we and we really do. I am absolutely addicted to looking at our analytics. Shout out to Connecticut two weeks in a row as our number one download. Oh, actually, hold on. You know, I complain on this show a lot that our paranormal episodes do not do as well as our crime podcasts. Well, we have two paranormal episodes in the top five. What? Yes. Good for them. Which ones are they? Coming in at number four, we've got Haunted University, Moored State University. Woo! And coming in at number three, we've got Waverly Hills. Awesome. Both Um, places, super haunted, super fun. Casey Anthony is um, number two, and Ted Bundy is number one currently. Oh, awesome. I thought that Ted Bundy would be uh, would be high up there because he is the he is the serial killer that started me down the true crime. And you know, I think path. he's kind of the serial killer that intrigues the most people. Yeah. Because he was um he wasn't what you thought of when you thought of serial killer. No, and we've got a very interesting, speaking of events that started us down our path, we're going to be covering a topic later this year that actually got me started on reading true crime books. Same here. Um, I actually probably read this years before I was um, mentally and emotionally ready to read it. Yeah, because I remember reading it in high school, so... And I read it right after you read it. So I was, you know, late grade school. Yeah. So interesting. Can't wait for that. Um, We have a great year lined up and I am so excited. I'm so excited to jump in and. We have so many awesome episodes coming for you. Um, I mean, just next month, we've got some outstanding topics. Yeah, we're trying to add, um, we're trying to add a little bit more Unsolved Mysteries, and we're trying to, uh, make the balance of, um, mainstream... And kind of... And, and like, hardly heard of. You know, we're trying to balance, like, the cases that made national news that everybody knows about with the, you know, Cleveland torso murder kind of crimes. We have, um, I don't, we have an episode coming up in July that my boyfriend has been hounding us to cover for, well, since we started this podcast. So. Yeah, so exciting very very exciting so thank you so much for sticking with us and um, if you like us tell your friends um, you know share us with everybody and rate and review us on whatever avenue it is that you listen to us and you know what I think that sometime in the next month or so we'll probably be having another contest so yeah listen for that some awesome handmade by us merchandise because well we both have Etsy shops so that's kind of what we do yeah so anyway thanks for listening and I will see you next week bye bye